So the setup work that we're going to go through is we're going to make a really simple Rails application, and it's going to be the API of our uh, that we're going to end up working with. And so I'm at my command prompt here, and I'm running a Rails new uh, Chuck because I'm going to make a Chuck Norris API. Uh, this would be new Rails new Chuck. And I'm going to add that folder to my VS Code workspace, Chuck. And I have to go and put that fix that we've been dealing with in place. I guess first I will check everything into version control, initial commit of Rails project, period. Control enter. Okay, and so we have that fix that we need to put in place, which is on line nine. I have to add a comma and then in quotes, tilde greater than uh, space 1.3. either 6 or 13. I use 13 because that's the actual version of the gem that we have. That's one aspect of the fix. The next aspect of the fix is that from the command prompt, I need to bundle update just that gem. So that's bundle update SQLite 3. Oh, I'm not in the right folder. Navigate to the folder and then run it. So that was what I ran there, bundle update SQLite 3. And I know I'm going to make use of Faker, so I'm going to go and Google for the Faker gem. And I'm going to grab the gem file line from the installing section, which is right here. And I'm going to put that in the development section on line 51. Paste that in on line 51. And then a bundle install will install that. And then I can go into my source control. I can say SQLite gem version fix plus added. Baker. Cool. I only, I'm going to just use scaffolding here. I just want to scaffold up a really quick app uh, that will have a single table that we can use as an API. Uh, Rails is a really quick way to, to fire up an API. So I can say Rails generate scaffold. It's going to be Chuck Norris facts. So I'm going to say uh, fact is what I'm scaffolding, and a fact is just going to have some content, which is a type text. And then after I run this, I'll just write a really simple seed script that will give me all of the Chuck Norris facts that Faker has at its disposal. So I'll run this scaffold command. I'll migrate it as well after I uh, after the scaffold generator runs. So a Rails DB migrate. Go to my source control, added the fact scaffold and migrated. And then in my DB folder, I can pull up my seed script. I can delete the existing comments inside of there. I happen to know that Faker has exactly 77 Chuck Norris facts at its disposal. So I will say 77.times do. 
And then I'm going to say fact.create, where the content is. Baker, I don't know. Let me just quickly see where Chuck Norris lies. Is it Chuck Norris fact, I guess? Come on, Chuck. There it is. Chuck Norris dot what? Fact. Chuck Norris dot unique dot fact. I don't want any repeats. Man. At which point I should be able to run that seed script and we'll have our operational Chuck Norris API. So I can say Rails DB seed. Rails console just to see if that worked. So fact.count, fact.first.content. There you go. So I've got Chuck Norris facts in my database. If I run the Rails server, I should be able to pull up the localhost slash facts. And there's all of my Chuck Norris facts. And we're going to be using it as an API. So if I add a .json to the end of the URL, there's that same data, but encoded instead of in HTML, but encoded as JSON. So this is a single fact right here. So it's an array of JavaScript objects is how Rails has modeled this data. So this is going to be the API endpoint that I'm going to hit with some JavaScript. The JavaScript is simply going to recreate, oh, not this page. I'll get rid of that page. Recreate a simple version of this page. In the end, it's going to seem like a lot of work just to get the same content as is present here. But that's because I'm just doing this with you know vanilla JavaScript, JavaScript without any frameworks. When we return back from after uh, midterms, we'll talk about JavaScript frameworks. Uh, sort of the top three right now are like Angular, uh, React, and Vue. And React is probably the, the number one out of those three in terms of usage these days. The one I'm going to be teaching in this course is the one that I think is the simplest, which is Vue. Uh, and it is closely related to how it does things to React close enough that when you understand how Vue works with its components, you'll be able to switch over to React uh, very easily. And so, yeah, what I want to do today with JavaScript is recreate this page, the ability to have JavaScript hit the API, fetch all of these Chuck Norris facts, and inject them into a page using the DOM, a page that is initially empty, and have them sort of using the DOM to sort of generate paragraph tags with each one of these facts within it. So there's a few things I'm going to need to do to set that up. And there's also a little bit of discussion around JavaScript that I want to do to set that up as well. I'll uh, just commit my seed script. Seed script to hello. Uh, Chuck Norris facts. And then open a secondary terminal. And I'm going to generate a controller with a single view. And I'm only going to use this view as sort of a placeholder for where JavaScript is going to do its work. So I'm going to say Rails generate a controller called Ajax that has a single action and view called index. So if I hit enter here, I will get an Ajax controller with a single view, which is this one right here. I'm going to open up the routing file as well. So I want to work with that. Oh, I don't want to see both copies. I just want to see the routing file in the config folder. Oh, 
All right, so in the routing file, I am going to get rid of the route that was added automatically for me and put in resources, Ajax only index. I think because it's only a single thing, I could probably even get rid of those square braces. Let's see if that works. And then I will go to make a root route that will go to the same place, the Ajax controllers index action. So I should now be able to go to slash Ajax or just to the root and see uh, a blank page or the page that has this kind of template-y stuff in it. So let me see if that is working. Facts should still work. The root route should go to that template-y page. And slash Ajax does as well. I guess if I have it as the root, I, I probably don't even need that route, but we'll leave it in. Added an Ajax controller. Okay. Here in the controller, nothing is gonna happen here. So unlike when we had controllers that were gonna make use of the Rails view systems where we would actually have the controller load up data, hand it off to the view, none of that's going to happen at this point. We're just going to have Rails serve up the data from an API. So I don't need to change this in any way. I mean, I could put a little, little comment in here saying something like, uh, Retrieval of data and view generation handled by JavaScript. At least that way, if someone came to my code and they could look in this uh, index and they're wondering why it's empty, at least there's a little uh, reason as to why it's empty. So that'll stay empty. If I look, uh, I want some JavaScript to execute. All of my JavaScript is in a Rails app stored in the Assets folder. So if I go into the Assets folder, we'll see that there is a place to put images and a place to put JavaScript and a place to put CSS or SAS style sheets. So I'm going to look in the JavaScripts. By default, Rails still assumes that you're going to use CoffeeScript for your client-side coding. We're not gonna be using CoffeeScript. CoffeeScript is a language that gets transpiled into JavaScript. All of, or many of the good ideas from CoffeeScript are now part of JavaScript proper. So it's, in my mind, served its purpose. It sort of showed the JavaScript community that JavaScript could be a much better language. And all of the, the things that CoffeeScript brought to the table uh, are basically now integrated into JavaScript itself. And so I'm going to rename this file from .coffee to .js. And then I will delete those comments. They're no longer valid JavaScript comments. And I'm just going to put an alert in here just to test to see if my JavaScript is working. If I reload this page, I should now see that alert pop up. Working. Same thing goes if I go to the facts page, working. So the way that these JavaScript files are loaded, even though this one's called ajax.js, it's not simply going to load only on like the Ajax uh, view. It's loaded up everywhere. It's loaded up on all pages. It does not, of course, get triggered, though, when we go to the API. So if I go to my facts.json, that doesn't have any JavaScript kick in because that's not an HTML representation. But for anything that has 
an HTML view, that JavaScript will execute. For everything else, it will not. So we can now remove that. Anyone have any issues up to this point or, or things that are not working on their version? Okay, I will commit these changes here. All right, good, 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 good. So in my index here, I will change this H1 to say uh, Chuck Norris Facts. And below it, at least for right now, I'm gonna put in a button with a class of reload. Not that be, this is not something that I necessarily need in my application, but it's going to give me an opportunity to talk a little bit about some more modern JavaScript practices to demo sort of how we maybe used to do things in JavaScript for how we might do things now. Uh, and we're going to do it around sort of adding a click handler to this button and sort of seeing how that uh, works. And then I will remove this button and we'll do the, the actual loading of the Chuck Norris facts. So we're going to take a little bit of a digression into sort of maybe what has changed in the JavaScript ecosystem or some of what has changed in the JavaScript ecosystem since you were taught uh, Web Dev 1, which is sort of the, you know, at least at that time, was sort of the older style JavaScript. ES5 is what you were learning in your Web Dev 1. And these days, well, you might hear the terms like ES6 or ES2015 or ES2017 thrown around. Those are sort of the more modern dialects of JavaScript. Uh, the reason for the ES and not JS is because there is a standards organization that actually runs the JavaScript language, and the standards organization is the ECMA uh, organization. Uh, ECMA, oops. ECMA, like that. And so the language is actually called ECMAScript, if I could just take cap locks off. Called ECMAScript. And there's some history to that. I won't go too detailed into that history, but back in the very early days of the web, so we're talking 1995, there was the early version of the browser wars. So there's still some variants of browser wars going on right now, like Edge versus Firefox versus Chrome. Uh, back in 95, the, the browser wars were primarily Internet Explorer versus Netscape Navigator. And at that time, the two browsers, the two teams or the two companies that were building these browsers were adding tons of features in a sort of a non-standard way. And it was considered, although slightly annoying, it was considered normal practice to check what your user's browser was before allowing them into your website and you could even like turn people away if they were using the wrong browser. So you would go to certain pages on the internet and it would say, sorry, this website is optimized for Internet Explorer 5, or this web page is optimized for Netscape Navigator, and it would not let you go to that page. And it's because they were using non-specific, uh, like non-standard features on that page, features that were only existent in particular browsers. So back in 95, uh, Netscape decided they wanted to add a programming language to the browser. There had been no programming language up to then. Uh, the web was very, very simple. It was primarily just HTML. Even uh, styling was done primarily through hard-coded attributes within your, uh, your HTML tags. So they decided to add a language and they gave one of their programmers about a week to create a language and add it to the browser. So this individual by the name of Brendan Etch created a programming language and Within a week, he had it up and operational and baked into Netscape Navigator, and we've been stuck with it ever since. Uh, it's not the worst language, uh, and in you know newer iterations of ECMAScript, it's it's a lot better than it used to be. Uh, but it initially was only part of Netscape Navigator, 
Microsoft got scared slash upset. They did not want to have, they knew that they were going to have to bring this language into their browser and they did not want it to be something that Netscape owned and operated and controlled. So they went to Netscape and said, how about we take this language, we take it to a standards body and we have the standards body run this language. No one will own it. It will be for the good of the internet that it will be, you know, uh, dealt with in a sort of an arm's length way. And the folks at Netscape said, okay, let's do this. That would never have happened if Microsoft had created it first. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's what happened. So to this day, we have ECMAScript. Uh, so the language evolves outside of the browser. It evolves over time. And then as it evolves, pieces of the newly evolved ECMAScript are brought into the browsers. And so they don't land in the browsers all at the same time. Sometimes different browsers will support different sets of the new features, uh, making it a little bit complicated for us as developers to know what we can or cannot use in our websites. But that's, um, that's the long and short of the, the history of, of ECMAScript and why it's called ES6 and not JS6 uh, or ES15. And so let's take a look at sort of maybe there's a lot that's changed since uh, the JavaScript that we taught you, but I'm going to just show some of the main things that you'll probably come across uh, when dealing with uh, JavaScript. What I would like to do is make it so that when I click on this button, something is going to be written to the console. So like console.log will occur. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a document. Uh, I always forget how to do the DOM content loaded thing. Uh, I, in Rails, I have to do this. Normally, when I'm coding JavaScript, I just put all my JavaScripts at the very end of the file, right before the close of the body tag, and I never have to worry about the DOM content being loaded or not, because if you load your JavaScripts at the very end of the file, the DOM content is always loaded. Uh, but in Rails, the JavaScripts get loaded up at the top, so we need to do like a DOM content ready uh, event listener. I, I did it with the other section. I think so. I think it's just, and it's, but I just never remember the capitalization of it. DOM content ready or loaded, loaded, and then function. Yeah, like I always used to use the, the jQuery ready or whatever too. Uh, but I think this will do it. Let's just check to see if I do another alert here. This should, just like the other one, load up an alert this time only after the actual after the browser has fully parsed the HTML and the DOM is ready to go. So back over on my Chuck Norris page, it's it's working. So what I want is when I can when I do Control Shift I that brings up my Dev Tools. And if I go to the console, I want a console message to be. Fired off every time I click this click me. And so I'm going to go here. I'll change the class to click to make it a little make more sense. So I've gone into the view and I changed the class of the button to click. And then inside of this DOM content loaded. Now I'm going to write the old style JavaScript first and then we'll talk about uh, sort of bringing it into sort of more modern uh, JavaScript. So maybe with old style JavaScript, I might use an ID instead. So I'll do document dot get element by ID. Click. Oh, I need I need to actually save this to a variable. Uh, call it button element. So one thing I quickly did there is in the view, I changed that to from a class to an ID. And so it has an ID of click. I'm now finding it with a get element by ID. And then I'm going to the button element. And I'm adding an event listener to it. So we've got an event listener within an event listener. Not the end of the world, but that's what we got. And I want to click one where I've got a function, in this case, Hand the event off to the function. And inside of there, I will say console.log. 
and I think I have an event type. Um, I'll just say uh, an event was triggered. Let's see if it's event dot type. And that should tell me that a click event was triggered. So let me see if this works and I'll come back to my code. Click me and it says an event was triggered. So the code looks like this. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things that have been added to ES6 or ES2015, some of the ways that in which we might change this code here. One of the first ones is the var keyword. So in place of var, so JavaScript used to be super permissive. We, we used to be able to even just not even use var. We could just start using a variable. We wouldn't even need to identify it. If you were like a, you know, a very strict JavaScript programmer, you might always use var. These days though, we have two things that supersede var we have let and const and the scoping rules around let are a lot nicer than than var they make it so that a lot of the issues that we used to have around scoping in javascript go away so there's a lot of weird little edge cases and bugs that come into javascript code because of its overly permissive scoping around var let fixes that so i could change this to a let you don't have to really think too much about uh, the difference between let and far. It's just gonna be uh, less bugs are gonna occur in your code when you use let because you're not gonna be susceptible to those strange scoping rules. Here though, I'm never actually changing this button element once I assign it. So it actually could be a constant. And so it could be const instead of a let. So that's one change is that in modern JavaScript, we use let and const versus var. Another change is that JavaScript tends to be built out of a lot of callbacks, a lot of anonymous functions. You can see within this code itself, there are two anonymous functions being used. I've got one that's happening right here, this function here with no name and the body. And then this callback right here is another anonymous function. We have a new way of defining anonymous functions, uh, and there are some benefits to defining functions in this new way that I'll talk about, and it is the fat arrow syntax. So instead of using the function keyword, we keep the parentheses, and afterwards I'm just gonna put a fat arrow, as opposed to like a skinny arrow like that. So this is the fat arrow. Fat, it's called fat arrow syntax, or arrow syntax or a stabby. I tend to call these things stabbies for whatever reason, but that's fine. We can call it a stabby. It's a fat stabby, yeah. So there, there's the stabby syntax. If you're passing um, arguments to it, like this event, they're gonna stick around inside of the parentheses. If you only have a single one though, the parentheses can go away. The one thing, I like this fat arrow syntax, but I don't like all the weird edge cases there are. Like, oh, in this case, this thing can go away. In that case, this thing can go away. You know, if you don't, if you have a single statement, it'll do an implicit return. If you have more than one statement, you need the curly braces and it doesn't do the implicit return. I, there's a lot to remember and I don't like remembering things, right? As a programmer, anything we remember like has a half-life of like, I don't know, a few months before it changes again. I don't want to remember anything anymore. That's why I don't have exams in my courses anymore. I don't think we should remember anything. <laughs> oh no, I'm on the record. Uh, it's true though, right? Should we really have to remember anything anymore? The internet exists. Um, as long as you remember enough so that you're not constantly looking things up as you code. Yeah. Yeah, and like IntelliSense exists, it's a thing, right? And like, that's the one thats the one thing that's slowly driving me away from Ruby is it's such a dynamic language that I don't get good quality tooling in IntelliSense with, with it. I, I love the language, but I'm, I'm, I miss the fact that it doesn't have that strong um, tooling along with it. 
And I think I'm running prettier right now in, in VS Code because, like, if I save without these, they get put back. I don't know what's what what's doing this. I have VS Lint, and I have prettier. So, so one of them, one of them is doing something. Uh, I think I have VS Lint just set up to solely be the linter, so it'll just do the, the the squiggly underlines and whatnot. And I think I have prettier set up to format on save. Uh, this is very common in the JavaScript world to have a linter and a code formatter set up. This gets rid of sort of petty fighting on software teams about the one true style of formatting code, right? There, for years, we fought about, you know, should it be single quotes or double quotes? Should it be tabs or spaces? Like none of that stuff matters, right? But people have strong opinions about things that don't matter. And so... Uh, which is called bike shedding. If you ever you have a big meeting and someone says, "Ah, oh, that meeting was just a bunch of bike shedding. That's like people fighting over stuff that doesn't matter. And it goes back to a, uh, a thing that never actually happened, which was a bunch of engineers discussing a, uh, I guess, a nuclear power facility. And apparently they spent all their time talking about the color of the bike shed because that was something that did not matter that everybody had an opinion on where everything else was super important. So people talk in the programming world about bike shedding a lot. Um, and yeah, we all do it. And with code formatters though, we don't have to. Prettier just makes my JavaScript look like everyone else's. And if I don't want it to look that way, I just turn it off. And then you, someone else can put prettier as like a commit uh, hook on Git. And then boom, like it always gets prettied up before it hits your Git repo. So like if I don't want it to look that way, that's fine. Uh, but it will look like that way in the repo. It gets rid of all those those issues. And things like ESLint also go further and they sort of help you find sort of common errors that are present in your code. So those kind of, the, the whole language has changed over the past few years, but also the tooling around the language has changed significantly. Yes, when the like when those things actually changed how it was indented within, and so you'd sometimes get weird jaggedy source files because there's some tabs and some spaces, and now we can just go into our source code, uh, like VS Code, and say, well, make tabs show up as two spaces and indent with two spaces, and then that's not an issue anymore. So you're right. So a lot of those things that people used to uh, argue about are are not a big deal anymore. So those those things that I just talked about, the let versus cons and the, the, the stabby arrows, those are two additions to JavaScript. There are a lot more. Uh, and I, the other thing I mentioned is that the, the support for these things is not uniformly added over time to browsers. Uh, both the arrow functions and the cons and lets are pretty much uh, sort of safe to use these days. That said, there is a wonderful... A uh, website called caniuse.com, which literally tells you if you can use a thing or not. And it goes for not just JavaScript, but also for CSS. So as things get added to CSS or JavaScript, it lets you know. So if I type in let, it's like, okay, um, unless you want to support like Opera Mini or early uh, BlackBerry browsers, it, you're, you're pretty good. Uh, Const will be, you know, const will be similar. Uh, arrow functions. That was probably what was on early Windows phones. Uh, so you can see though that there's like, I, you still can't really ignore IE 11, right? As much as we would want to, uh, I, you know, I run these election websites uh, winnipegelection.ca. We had our most recent one. I built a tool for it, which was like an address lookup tool. And I had been doing a bunch of uh, coding. So if I, that was sort of like in the JavaScript, sort of trying to learn modern JavaScript. And I coded it up initially with just modern JavaScript practices. And then my buddy was like, you can't deploy that. It's not going to support IE 11. And I was like, oh, do I really have to care? And then I went to can I use and I looked and I was like, Okay, globally 2.37. Then I actually went and looked at our stats because we have Google Analytics and it was a little bit more than that even historically uh, here in Winnipeg of, of IE11. And that I'm thinking is there's large IT shops 
large enterprises, governments, where their ITS department has locked them at a particular version of Internet Explorer and will not allow upgrading. So I'm seeing nods. So you've been at some of these places. Yes, and it's because some of these companies have internal tools that actually depend on features or even worse, bugs in old versions of Internet Explorer so they cannot upgrade. They can't let their users use modern browsers because their internal tools won't work anymore. And there's also some ITS departments that are still like sort of trotting out the, 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 the truth that like the most secure browser is IE 11. <laughs> But you still hear it. So you can't really ignore that. So it's true. Now, but the nice thing that you can you can do instead is you can code in modern JavaScript and you can use tooling like Babel to do what's called transpiling. And so Babel takes in modern JavaScript and it spits out old school JavaScript, which is, see, it seems a little lame, but it's, it's our fix. It's it, what I said earlier on in, the, in the, the, the lecture that, you know, JavaScript was put, was built in a week and put into the browser and we were stuck with it ever since. That is the truth, right? Like you really can't make huge changes to JavaScript without breaking a sizable chunk of the internet. They can just add to the language or slowly make changes over time, but you have to always still be able to support all these old uh, websites, these old uh, browsers that are out there. So Babel or Babel, I don't really know how to pronounce it. Babel? Babel? Okay. Uh, it is a transpiler. You can even try it out live on uh, online. So if I took, I think I had with the other section, I took this code that I developed here and I copied it and I pasted it in here. And then here is the transpiled output on the other side. You can see that my const has been turned back into a var. My, uh, my arrow functions have turned back into functions. It's made it into old school JavaScript. And that is a good thing, right? So that means that we can write with the modern language, we can transpile with, with, with Babel. Babel has a new set of presets that will actively do a lookup on what is sort of the, the, can, the sort of the can I use sort of global usage stats, and they will transpile guaranteeing that you are hitting the majority of worldwide users. And as those global stats change over time, the output of Babel with that plugin uh, will, will change over time as well, which is sort of nifty. So that's that's our solution. We won't be getting into Babel uh, for this course. You can just assume that at least for what you're doing within the course, if you want to use modern JavaScript, just use modern JavaScript. You're controlling the browser that you're running on. <coughs> if you want to figure out how to hook Babel in, does Babel, when you have Rails running with Webpack, does Babel come along for the ride or... It does. Or, yeah, or did you have to install that yourself? It's built into that. Okay, so that so there's for a lot of things it's it's built in. Yeah, not in Rails proper. But you could bring it in as a package and yeah. Yes, you can say like Webpack React or something when you create it. That's nice. Okay, so that's I guess that's their solution to it. Okay, so that was a bit of a digression, but nonetheless, it's important. Uh, if you go to the docs on uh, the Babel website, there is a section on learning modern JavaScript, and you can see here that I've only covered you know, a few of what are a lot of new things. Like each one of these is a whole section on new things that have been added to the language since you were last using it. And so like, for example, classes. Uh, before ES 2015, we did not even have a class keyword in JavaScript because JavaScript was not uh, classically OO. It was prototypical object orientation. And so you had to mess with the prototype of an object in order to create new types of objects. 
we now have a class keyword in, in JavaScript. Uh, so yeah, so if you want to learn modern JavaScript, this is a good place to start. There's tons of tutorials out there for, for getting into it. Uh, template strings. This is like your, your Ruby style string interpolation as hits JavaScript. That's super slick to have. It is backticks. So that's the, instead of using a single quote or a double quote, you use backticks as your quotes, and then you can use uh, this style string interpolation. It's a dollar sign curly brace instead of a hash mark curly brace like in Ruby. That's a really nice new feature. Uh, object destructuring is, is super, super nice. Uh, and one of the things we're going to look at today, promises, is a really nice addition to, to JavaScript. But like all of these things are are handy additions, and they've really made JavaScript a modern, interesting language to, to deal with. So let's return a little bit to the notes here. And we'll talk a little bit about AJAX. AJAX was an acronym that was first mentioned way back in 2005. So that's a good, what, 14 years ago? And at the time, when we were sending data over the internet, structured data over the internet, it tended to be XML. And so AJAX at that time stood for asynchronous. And so asynchronous means like things are all happening at the same time. Rather than synchronous, things are happening one after the other. So asynchronous, JavaScript, and XML. These days, unless you're using a legacy API, you're likely using JSON or receiving JSON. So these days, the X in AJAX actually stands for JSON, or at least we can pretend it does. Um, promises. Whenever you're dealing with anything that is asynchronous in JavaScript, you have to have some way of dealing with the fact that you're going to ask for something and you're not going to get the result immediately. If you want to request something using like HTTP, you can fire off that request, but because of the latency of the internet or whatnot, you don't want to sit there waiting for your response. Instead, what we have in JavaScript now is something called a promise. And a promise is just a object that represents the eventual result of an asynchronous operation. So I'll request a, a JSON file and I get a promise back. And the promise is basically saying, I promise to give you this JSON file when it comes back. And a promise can be in a bunch of different states. And initially, it's in a pending state. It's not yet what is called fulfilled or rejected. If the result comes through and there were no errors, the promise was fulfilled. If it failed to retrieve whatever result it was supposed to retrieve, the promise was rejected. And regardless of the outcome being fulfilled or rejected, once it's one of those two things, it's considered to be settled. So when you fire off a promise, you get a pending promise back, and then it gets settled to either a fulfilled or a rejected state. And so we're going to use promises for two things today, one for asynchronous HTTP requests. Another thing is going to be uh, for uh, deserializing the JSON that we get back, because that's also something that takes time. So you get a bunch of string back, and you need to turn that into an actual JavaScript object. You don't get that conversion immediately, because the deserialization can take some time. So you get a promise back. How do we deal with promises? Well, we deal with them just like we deal with events. We deal with them with callbacks. So what we're going to see is we're going to make a request, we're going to get a promise back, and then the API around promises is that you have a dot then function that you can call on a promise that takes a callback, and that callback will be executed when the promise is fulfilled. And so we chain dot thens onto a promise to deal with the results, and we can add a further dot catch onto the end of that chain as a way of catching errors that may crop up in terms of the promise. So if the promise ends up in a rejected state, we can trigger that catch. Or if just an error or an exception happens it, in some way within, either within our callbacks or within the promise itself, the catch will be there to catch that error. 
So I'm going to take a little bit of code from the notes and I will let you see it, give you some time to copy it. I'm going to remove what was prior, it, what I had in my uh, anonymous function for my DOM content loaded. And I'm going to paste in this code right here. Initially, we're not even yet using the API that we've built ourselves. I'm just going to my favorite dog.ceo API and getting a list of all breeds. This call right here, this call to fetch, I'm using fetch in its simplest form where I just fetch a URL. So it'll default to a get request. So this is gonna make an HTTP get request. And then this then right here is me chaining on a way of dealing with the eventual fulfillment of that promise. And I guess I could change this to an arrow function. So I could change this to result in an arrow. And then I could probably bring that up over there. Yeah, exactly. And so there, there I'm making my fetch. This returns the promise. I could save that promise in a variable if I wanted. I don't have to chain dot then on it immediately. Uh, but it just makes sense to chain it on immediately. So I call dot then on it, and then I say, when the promise is fulfilled, get the result of that promise and hand it off to this function, at which point we're just going to do a console log, and it's going to display the status. That's the HTTP status code of the result. So we'll know if this worked if I see a status of 200 when this uh, document loads up. So I go back over to my Chuck Norris page, and I reload it. And almost immediately, we see HTTP response status 200. OK, that's good. That means I was able to hit that endpoint and get the results. I haven't yet tried to deserialize the JSON that's coming back and then do anything with it. That's what we're going to do next. We can really quickly take a look at what this looks like. So if I paste that in here. I'll uh, just use Firefox. I don't have a nice little extension. Firefox has a nice way uh, just built in to deal with, with JSON. And so it, it shows me that what I'm getting back is a JavaScript object with a status and a message object. And so my response.message is where all of my breeds are. The breeds are the keys and there are arrays of subbreeds, I'm going to just go in the simplest manner and just simply look at the keys that I'm getting back from this message. So first thing first, I have to deserialize the JavaScript and then I want to loop through the breeds and just console.log them. So step one to deserialize the JavaScript, I'm going to return the result.json. I'm going to simplify that in a moment, but for now I'm going to return the result.json. This call to .json, it's an asynchronous call. It sometimes takes quite a bit of time if you're grabbing a whole bunch of JSON. You don't want it to block at that. So I get a promise back from that. So in order to deal with that, I got to chain on another then here to deal with that. This is a single line anonymous function that returns something. I can remove that and you know, I can get rid of the curly braces. I can get rid of the semicolon. I can get rid of the return. And I can just do this. I'm going to chain the then over here. This is when. This is the style of the fat arrow syntax that gives us an implicit return like a Ruby uh, function would. Here I'm getting the result arrow and then I've taken, gotten rid of the curly braces, got rid of the return uh, keyword, and it's still going to return the result of that, which is a promise at which point I can then on that. That's my data. That's, those are my breeds and some other things. And so I can get that data and I can make another function to process those breeds. 
I'm going to const them, reads, and I'm going to go to the object object and just use the keys. I think I can do that. Yeah, the object object. It's got a bunch of help, uh, handy helper functions in it to deal with objects. And so if I pass it data, it's going to return all the keys of the data for me, which are the breeds that I actually care about. It's going to be all these. Oh, but it's not message that it, it's my message. So I got to call that on dot message. Data dot message is where that object is. And then the keys of that message are the breeds. I'm just going to throw the, uh, the values away. And then I'm going to use the for loop style, which is const breed. Is it of breeds? I think so. So that's a new style uh, for loop, similar to our for eaches or our eaches in Ruby. So it's uh, you know for for every element in this breeds collection, it'll temporarily call each element breed and then go on to the next one. And then I can console.log each breed. It's really interesting. It can be const because it uh, loses scope at the end of every single iteration. And I only know that because I was always writing it as let. And then ESLint was telling me that I could make it const. And I was like, oh, OK. That was ESLint with the uh, Airbnb uh, add ons. So like Airbnb, the company has its own plugin for ESLint that is a like a very, very opinionated way of writing JavaScript. So normally when I'm ESLinting, I'm doing it in the Airbnb style. Which is funny that a commercial organization has created a whole style of writing JavaScript that we all tend to use when writing modern JavaScript these days. Airbnb style. I mean, it used to be in the early days of Ruby, it was like Portland style Ruby. There was such a huge Ruby community in Portland that everybody wrote Portland style Ruby. So I guess instead of a, like a geographic space, this is a, a company. There must be a lot of JavaScript programmers, Airbnb. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's run this and see if it does all the things, right? So it's supposed to fetch this URL with an HTTP uh, get request. We'll take the results when the promise is fulfilled, the fetch promise, and try to convert them into JSON, which itself returns a promise that we chain then onto. Once the JSON is deserialized, we'll get it into this data variable. We then go to the data's message property, and we knew to do that because of looking it up in Firefox, and we saw that the data returned had a message property, which was, was an object with keys and values. I only want the keys. So I ask for them using object.keys, and then I loop over each one, printing them out to the console. So if I go back to my web page and I reload it, I see all of the dog breeds echoing out here for me. I should now be able to convert this to actually use my Chuck Norris fax and have those Chuck Norris facts by way of the DOM get injected into this page. So let's do that. Before I do that, any question on this? And note that I also could have, you know, chained on a catch where I, you know, where I, I catch any potential errors that are occurring here. And you definitely would want to always have a catch on any of the promise change that you create because JavaScript Without that kind of stuff in place, JavaScript will, will fail silently. Right? The only way your user would know that something has failed is if they went into the, the console. Right? And very few users are going to go into the DevTools dev console to see if an error is thrown. You'll see like a red JavaScript error if an error has been thrown in there. But otherwise, from a user's perspective, when JavaScript breaks, it just silently fails. And it just stops executing at that point. And all other JavaScript associated with that page will then silently fail. It just blows up. And so you want to be sure that you catch any errors and handle them gracefully. Pop up some message or log it somehow. Um, I really, really love uh, Bugsnag. Uh, 
Bug Snag does live monitoring of errors for you, and you can just plug Bug Snag in as a library into your JavaScript programs, and any time an exception is thrown, it will log it to a service. I have my Bug Snag set up to hit my Discord, so it'll like send me a message on Discord anytime I've got an error. And I've also got it set up for my Android apps. So when I have Android apps that are deployed out to all of my users, and when I think my Android apps are perfect, right? I run them a few times on my phone. I'm like, this is done. I'm a great programmer. Uh, and then I push them out to the world and I get reports back saying there's problems with your code, but I'm not there looking over everybody's shoulder. With Bug Snag hooked in, anytime any of my Android apps fail in the field, the exact error and the whole stack trace gets sent to my Bug Snag account and in a few days I fix it. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, just uh, the Meow Reader app, which is like pictures of cats learning how to read. Uh, <laughs> Google Play Store Meow Reader. We'll just find it. There. Oh, no, that's like some sketchy website. <laughs> Let's not go there. So I have the Meow Reader. It's, it's super popular, of course. Uh, it's just my app that I use to... Uh, Oh, apps, please. Oh, it's it's like, come on, give me Meow Reader. It's, it's my sort of my experimental app where I try things out within the context of, it's like a, it's it's interesting enough of an app that it lets me try out new things. Yeah, look at, look at my rating. I'm rocking like a four point something. And so Meow Reader is one of my apps. Uh, and yeah, every, I usually am playing around with like uh, hybrid uh, development on Meow Reader. So the first version of Meow Reader was like a PhoneGap Cordova app. Uh, the most recent one was Cordova again, but with Vue.js uh, powering it. The other app that I have that is a little bit more realistic is Winnipeg News. And it uh, it doesn't have as high of a rating as Meow Reader, unfortunately. Uh, Early versions of Winnipeg News were a Cordova app, and eventually it completely stopped working because because uh, I, I wasn't updating it. And then a few terms ago, I audited Jody's mobile development course, and through that, rewrote the app as a native Android app. And this is the one that I have Bug Snag uh, hooked into, and we can sort of see if can I log in here. Dashboard. It's the same kind of thing, though, right? Sentry.io. And Bug Snag is also free, so yeah. So you can see here, these are that's yeah, that's my Winnipeg News app. And so, like as errors occur, I get to see exactly uh, what the the exception was when they occurred, whether they're uh, handled. So like, did I have some way of handling them within the system, or are they unhandled? The unhandled are the worst. That means straight up that the user's phone, uh, like the app, crashed. So that those are the ones that I, I need to look into. So that was a bit of a digression, but it's it, these kind of bits of tooling are super, super important to, to know about because it's very easy to assume that the code that you produce is working and then you yeah, just release it to the world and, and let it be. And if you have some kind of tooling around gathering the errors, that can be very powerful. And so, yeah, please download meowreader.com and give me a five-star rating. There you go. Uh, you can also download Winnipeg News. I have more... There you go. I, I have more users of uh, of this app. I'm I'm over ten thousand installs, but that's not active installs. Ding ding ding. So there's uh, those are the apps. Let's resume. I do. That was one of the the features that I thought was very important. It was a user request. They're like, "Where's the night mode?" I'm like, "Okay, I can do that." Every app needs a night mode, right? Uh, yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't yet use the phone's timing to like go on to night mode at night. Yeah. I, that's the thing is, I just have always all of my apps in night mode if I can. Uh, okay, so let's return here and actually use our API, like the one that we built with Chuck Norris jokes. So that is uh, a slash. Facts.json. 
is what's going to pull up the JSON file. So slash facts.json. And this is still fine. I'm still going to take the result and I still need to deserialize it. I don't need to do anything with the keys anymore because the data I'm getting is just straight up an array of hashes. And so the data is itself the facts. And so for const fact as or of facts. And then for each fact, it is the facts content. That was uh, what I wanted to output. Okay, if I run this, if I go back to my root route, all my Chuck Norris jokes appear in the console. So that's working. I was able to properly hit the API endpoint, deserialize the JavaScript, and print it out. But what I really want is I want it to be displayed up here. What I want to replicate at least part of this facts page. Right? I don't need the show or the edit buttons, but I want all of the facts to be there. So what do I need to do? Well, over on the view side of things, in my index.html.erb, I've got to go here, and I'm going to put a div with a class of facts. That's a place that JavaScript can hook into, right? This is something, this is an element that JavaScript can locate and then inject or add children to. Inside of my JavaScript code, I'm then going to find that. So I'm going to say my facts div is document dot uh, query selector dot facts. Was query selector and query selector all part of Web Dev One when you went through it? That was a long time ago. Anyways, that's the the instead of doing like get element by classes or get element by d, uh, query selector is effectively J jQuery brought into uh, JavaScript, so you can select based on CSS selectors. Uh, so like dot facts, or you know, if I wanted to find a a div, or if I wanted to find like some div that had a class. It lets you just query in the same way that jQuery does. And so query selector will find the first thing that matches. Query selector all will find a collection of things that match. And in this case, I just want to find the very first div that has a class of facts on it. So query selector is really, really nice. Once it hit the browsers, that was when I uh, stopped using jQuery. And so now I have my facts div. And for each fact, I'm going to create a, so we're doing this vanilla JavaScript style, right? So I'm going to create a paragraph tag. So I'm going to say const uh, fact p document.create uh, element. Put that one on the next line. Uh, it's an element of type p. Is there a more proper way to add this than using inner HTML or is inner HTML fine? Inner text, inner text works is probably faster because it's it, this is not going to include HTML, so it doesn't actually have to process it, right? So I could probably use one or the other. So is it like that? Were they any were any faster or slower than the others or oh, okay. Yes. Because like the proper way would be like document.create text node and then add that text node to the, the paragraph. Yeah. So let's just leave it like this. And then I'm gonna go to my fax div. And I'm going to append child the fact p. Probably, because it has to. 
Uh, yeah, because well, it's probably because does React have templating built in, or there's probably some kind of cross-site scripting way of attacking it. Intertext is a little bit safer because it won't process. Uh, but if we needed, and there we go. Look at that. I reload my page. And I got all my Chuck Norris jokes. There's a small delay, right? So you'll see the page appear. And initially, the page will just have the header. And then it fills it in. This can get a little bit out of hand in terms of like, I don't like to have this much code inside of a callback. I like to sort of clean my callbacks up. And so I'll do that now. I'll go up here, I'll make a function called add facts to page that takes in some facts. And I will take these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines and paste them in here and then dedent them. And then instead of that, I could just say add facts to page. I prefer things like that because we already have a callback within uh, a callback here. Just having many layers of callbacks within callbacks, I find just to be a little bit spaghetti-ish. So I find that this makes my code a little bit easier to read. I'm fetching the facts, I'm deserializing them, and then I'm adding the facts to page. I just mentioned the function that I want the facts handed off to by name, and then it's gonna, it's always going to be handed off whatever the promise data is, and so the promise data is the facts. That'll be automatically handed off by this then. And so if I go back to the code and I rerun it, it should just run like it did before, but I find like the code written in this way is a little bit cleaner. And then, as I said, we should probably have, uh, if we were writing, you know, proper uh, production-ready code here, we would chain a catch-on there to make sure that we were catching any errors that might occur. Uh, even in the notes, there was there was some kind of browser inconsistency around error handling that I came across. So some browsers uh, don't throw errors when the response isn't uh, at HTTP 200 OK, and some browsers do. And so we can put this handle errors into the chain as a way of uh, injecting errors that are now uniform across all browsers. So you could inject this up. Right here, we could say then handle errors. I can't remember. I just remember that it wasn't uniform and that this was a way of sort of making it uniform. So if it's not okay to throw the error, and then I could put a final catch on at the end of it. Well, at least it's, it's you know, uniform. at least it's like, yeah, and it's, it's you know, then, 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 you know. Uh, Error. So yeah, I know we should probably handle errors without using an alert, but I, I'm not gonna bring in a whole modal operation here. And, and yeah, but again, like I wanted a proper error for the user, right? Because no one's gonna look at the console. Sorry. Um, I don't know what this error even looks like. Let's break this by making this URL uh, the wrong URL and seeing if my error handling kicks in. Sorry, error not found. So not the nicest error message, right? You would of course want to. Well, again, not showing up would likely mean that all other JavaScript on the page was broken uh, because of 
because of that. Uh, and in this case, it wouldn't be. It would at least have caught the error and displayed something. But yeah, you would probably want to put a lot more effort into your error handling rather than just throwing up an alert message. Uh, one of the things that I did not yet mention is we've only uh, so far looked at uh, fetch as a way to get data. We can, of course, post data with the fetch. I'm not going to give you a full demo of that, but I can just show you what the code would look like. I'll grab two examples of posting data. In this first example, I am posting to a fictional endpoint. And you have to assume that somewhere on my page, there is a form. So like if you had a, a web uh, page that had a form, what I'm doing here with this fetch request is I'm sending, I'm going to that form, packaging it up as form data, and then I'm hitting this endpoint with an HTTP post request. And then that might get back a response to me and I can see whether you know the post went through or not. I could also some, um, this would be for an endpoint that was assuming that a form was posting to it. A lot of endpoints these days will just straight up accept JSON. And so here is a post request where I'm stringifying a JavaScript object into JSON, sending that as the body, and then in the headers specifying that the content type is JSON, and then sending that to a JavaScript endpoint that actually accepts JSON. This website, by the way, is incredibly awesome for prototyping or messing with uh, fetch or any other kind of, when you need a sort of a, an endpoint, it's sort of like a live faker for uh, a bunch of different REST endpoints. So you can get posts and comments and albums and photos and to-do lists and users uh, from these different endpoints. Uh, all of these routes exist. You can post and put and patch and delete to them. You can get to them. It's a really nice uh, sort of pretend REST API that when you're first sort of prototyping or you're just you know, building out an app and you want to test something out, this JSON placeholder website is really, really nice. It's built on a open source project called JSON Server. And so if you wanted to uh, build your own variant of this placeholder API, you could just uh, bring up a server with the JSON server project and you could have it return any sort of data that you wanted. But I really like using JSON placeholder as a way of uh, prototyping things that need endpoints in place, maybe before I built one myself. So yeah, those are two ways of posting data with the fetch. And there's all sorts of others. So notice like when we use fetch just in its simplest form, we were just passing a single argument that was the URL. In these more complicated forms, the first argument is still the URL, but after that is an object. And there are lots of different keys that can go with that object. So you here you, you've seen I can, I've used method and body and headers. There's lots of different possibilities. So that's something you'd want to research. All the different things that the fetch API can do in terms of its options. What else do I got for you, Ajax-wise? Talked about, can I use? Oh yeah, so a few other things to, to mention is, um, if we go to can I use, and we ask for fetch, we'll see that once again, it is not supported across the board. Right, IE 11 does not support the Fetch API. Uh, and so if you want to support all your users, uh, that's a bit problematic. For any of the things that you look up on Can I Use, if you go to the resources section, they will usually list what is called a polyfill. A polyfill is a little bit of JavaScript that will add new features to old browsers if they don't exist. And so you can polyfill promises into old browsers. You can polyfill fetch into old browsers. Uh, a lot of people in the JavaScript community, instead of using fetch, they use what's called Axios, which works. The API is very, very similar to how fetch works. Uh, 
Axios does support IE11, but you still need a promises polyfill for it to actually work. I found out the hard way. So even though it claims IE11 support, you still need to, to polyfill promises into, into the browser. And so, again, I did that by searching uh, promises and then finding the promises polyfill that was listed. I think I used this one. I can't remember. Yeah, I did. And then I laughed because Steph Penner used to be a Winnipegger, uh, used to be part of the Ruby community here. So that was a little little Winnipeg moment. This guy's now living in, in California. But when it was time to add promises as a polyfold to my website, Steph came to the rescue. I was like, yeah, that's cool. Uh, he made that specifically for anyone who needs to backfill promises into uh, an, an older browser. So it's just a little... Uh, script that you can pull in from a content delivery network that will just automatically add a promise if it's not present in the browser. So if the browser already has promises in, it won't add anything. And if the browser doesn't, it'll add them. So once I polyfilled promises, then I could use Axios with own any issue. That was for the Winnipeg election site. I, we have a lot of users that are using older browsers so that we, we basically needed to, to support them by way of the polyfill and using Axios. That was the that was the fix there. I mean, yeah, that would be the passive aggressive way of dealing with it. Uh, just use this new browser. Uh, the the community is still under flux, right? So I've taught you fetch today, uh, but there's also this style of dealing with with uh, asynchronous. Uh, things in JavaScript, which is called async await. Uh, that I'm not yet uh, ready to teach myself. I've done a little bit of messing around. When you're using async await, you basically flag individual functions as asynchronous. And then when you call them, you, you sort of await them. And it makes your code look like there's no callbacks in it. It makes your code look like it's sort of sequential and uh, procedural. Uh, but it still is a solution for dealing with asynchronous things. Uh, it sort of hides the promises from you a little bit. I just simply linked to a tutorial that covers using fetch with async await. So I will post these notes up to learn because they're not currently part of the learn course because these are web dev two notes now, not uh, full stack notes. So I'll post these up to, to our learn news feed. And I think that's all I got for you for today. The only other thing I was going to mention was if I bring up the the rest of our class time this week is going to be marking. And I just wanted to make sure that this marking spreadsheet, which is linked to from the project, just so that you're aware, there are certain elements on this page where the element is mentioned multiple times. And you only get one of those things, right? So for 1.3, for example, it's like how many active record uh, object or how many active record models do you have? Do you have two? Do you have three? Do you have four or more? Uh, if you have four or more, you don't get the previous two. So you basically, it's mutually exclusive. You get one out of those three. Same thing goes for section 1.7 uh, data sources. You either get three, marks, six marks, or nine marks, but you can't get more than that. Yes, if they're all from different sources, then yes, you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there, there you go. So I just wanted to make that clear. You can use this as a way of marking yourself remember that uh any marks you receive this week so any of marks you receive next class or the class after will get a 1.3 beside them rather than a one beside them uh other than that uh yeah that's all i wanted to say for today